Let's head over to Honolulu, buddy. Honolulu. As the investigation into a deadly ambulance fire in Kalawe, how would you say that? So I don't get in trouble with all of our Hawaii. Kailua. Kailua. Yeah. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. Um, Gets underway. The Hawaii Firefighters Association said it wants its workers to stay out of Honolulu ambulances until the investigation is complete and safety measures are in place. An ambulance caught fire as it pulled into Adventist Health Castle Hospital around 8 p.m. during a 911 call for a 91-year-old man in serious condition. He died inside the ambulance. Oh, damn. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't open my mouth there because I was going to crack a joke. And then, Yeah, hold on. It'll get worse. The injured 36-year-old paramedic, a 10-year veteran, was initially treated at, uh, so this was like the the ambulance um, medic, uh, taken to the hospital. and then He was at the hospital already. Right. Yeah, but they took him from that hospital to a uh, emergency burn unit. Oh, okay. Um, so the the paramedic remained in critical condition as of the the writing of this. And then, so the HFFA president Bobby Lee said, "We don't want our ambulances. We don't want our members in the back of an ambulance, and we hope that they put great priority on doing a preliminary investigation to find out exactly what." Uh, like what started this? I'm fire. thinking one thing that didn't help was the oxygen in the ambulance. That's probably, that, you know. Yeah, I mean, you think of all the things in an ambulance that would, like, make that worse. Oxygen, oxygen would be huge, especially if it's like I know that uh, those house tanks, right? Like those big, four foot, right? Big tanks be, you know. I mean, I think you would hear it, but at the same time. It could just be one of the trees, you know, your little auction trees just open. Well, if it's a critical patient, right, which this one was, this uh, this 91-year-old who was critical, they probably absolutely had oxygen on, which was filling the cab, right? Like, it's not all going into the patient. Yep. Um, so I looked up, and I was like, man, how often does this happen? How often do these ambulances catch on fire? So um, there were multiple fires in 2013 uh, in DC and then in Myersdale in 2015, um, same thing. They had a, an ambulance catch fire. It's not horribly surprising. I mean, these rigs, depending on how, like what your staffing model is, they idle 24 seven and then they get run super hard and then they go back to, I mean, they're never, they're never off. We had a fire truck catch fire. Really? Station. Yeah. At the station? Yeah, nines years ago. I think we also had one at 13s. Whoa. So we had two. I think there was some wiring issue. I, I actually think it was... Because they were plugged of, in, right? Yeah, but I think it was some um, aftermarket wiring work, potentially. <sighs> like wires rubbing, you know. I, I don't know, but... Yeah, that's a... Uh, wake up to that. It's brutal, right? So then as a fire chief, you're like, hey, and I'm... I don't know the exact model that that uh, that Honolulu runs, but it sounds like it's kind of like ours, where you have an ambulance service that comes and picks somebody up, and then you have the fire department respond. But I mean, like you said, it happens to fire trucks too. So everything's grounded in Honolulu. It was. Well, I mean, they still have ambulances on the streets, but they're fire chiefs. Like you can't get in the back of those anymore. Hmm. I mean. Fucking brutal, man. Call 911 because your 91 year old family member is sick and they get all torched Catches up. It's on fire. That's not good. No. I'm curious to know out of the stories that I read, I mean, they have fire extinguishers on them. You know, like I, I wonder how fast it went from, and maybe it was the oxygen, right? Like, hey, we're having some smoke in the engine compartment and then it it's just spread too fast involved, for yeah. you to even do yeah. anything about. What would you do in that situation? You're in the back of the ambulance, and you're like, <laughs> smells like smoke. Yeah, I mean, it's not something you're like, pull over. Let's get out of here. You'd probably investigate. And, well, this was I mean, in, I would just imagine myself, I'd want to dive out and then pull the patient out. And This was in the ambulance there. bay. Right. At the hospital. So it's like. I don't know. But you're like, your first thing is, I'm going to get, I got to get this patient. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't really care about the ambulance. <laughs> No, Ooh, obviously right. not. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jesus, man. That'd be fucking brutal. So, no cause, no. 
Uh, I mean, this happened so recently that mm. they haven't uh, they haven't established that yet. Um. All right, something a little happier. All right, up to Alaska. Four friends hiking in Alaska rescued an injured woman and carried her down the mountain. It's pretty impressive. Okay, so uh, these four friends. They are firefighters in uh, Ohio. So um, the friends from Mentor, Ohio, planned their backpacking trip to Denali National Park in Alaska for over a year. Uh, The group included two firefighters, Patchinger and Jason Soren, a firefighter paramedic named Gabriel Anania, and Brian Brown. They arrived on June 22nd, and this is them saying, we figured we should probably do a light hike. Something kind of on the easier side to get us going. The group picked Flat Top Mountain near Anchorage uh, for its beautiful views. We hiked to the summit, they said, and the summit was absolutely beautiful. On their way down, they noticed a woman who was sitting there just did not appear right. The Tennessee woman in her 70s had hiked up to the mountain with her family member to spread her late husband's ashes. On the way down, injured her ankle and couldn't put any weight on it. It was two and a half miles left of the mountain to get her down. We ended up doing just rotating, giving her piggyback rides between the four of us until they got her all the way to the ground. It's fucking awesome, man. Yeah, how much did she weigh? Uh, I saw all the pictures okay. and, you know. Normal? Yeah, a couple stones, you know. Well, she was, she wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say she was like the thinnest person. We'll put, we'll put an image up here, but, you know. She was 71-year-old size. Piggyback rides. Two and a half miles downhill. It's pretty gangster, dude. Yeah. So it got me thinking about cremation. Spreading ashes? Yeah, man. So, like, what would you say is the cremation rate of the U.S.? Like, how many people get cremated? 40%. So, in 1960, it was 3.5%. Okay. 2018, 53.1%. All right. A lot of people choosing that one, choosing that way to go. Costs a lot to get buried. Costs a lot to get buried. Caskets cost a lot. Well, you can, in some faiths that don't uh, condone cremation, you can get cremated, but you then have to be buried inside a a cemetery. Oh, underground? Or like stored in one of those inside the buildings, yeah. I think it's a money grab, man. Let's say this, right? It's a pretty good use of having a piece of land. Making a cemetery? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, think about having a big piece of land. You know it's never going to get built in, on. Di- well, just dividing it. Well, that's not true because Cheeseman was an old cemetery. What? Yep. Really? Oh, yeah. Look it up. Are there ghosts out there now? You know they didn't get all the bodies. No, because they still find stuff to this day. Seriously, mm-hmm. dude? Look it up. Yeah. But how, okay, so you own a cemetery. You, let's just say you own a piece of land and you're like, I'm going to sell lots for people to build houses on, right? Well, now I'm, I mean, a lot sometimes when you pay a lot premium through builders, it could be like 10000 to 50000 right? I mean, I don't, what, what's a plot for, and then you want to reserve it for the rest of your family that's coming through? Okay, let's look this up. How much? <laughs> For burial plot. Sorry. Look up like Olinger Cemetery. All right. So this is between two thousand to five thousand dollars. Right. For a space. Okay. To dig a hole. Now they have to maintain the grounds. So I mean, cemeteries are typically very very. Well, well manicured, right? right? But I mean, you're talking a little tiny bit of land, two to five thousand through that whole thing, you know? It's not bad. No, oh, and then they have the buildings, right? They build a building and they do the wall. Well, that's not really taking up much real estate. Right. So you're saying I pound, don't think for, it, pound for pound. If you want to get just into... based on the industry, I'm not gonna say it's a money grab. It's <laughs> not gonna go that far. I'm just don't want to comment on it. Yeah. Let's put it that way. But it's a, I would think it would be a very lucrative business. Totally. Yeah. Especially if you're saying that you can't go to heaven unless you're. What is that classified as? Is that classified as 
agricultural or is it classified as residential? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's cold as ice dude yeah right, come on get what do you got you got some uh, applause for me i mean i'm oh hold on, hold on. oh why can't i move all it? right forget it what anyways with you worth it yeah i mean because that that affects your tax rate right yeah also um come on dude apple Airdrop it, buddy. Yeah, I cannot wait till you get an Apple device. It makes things happening. so much easier. Um, yeah, I think uh, also like what's it zoned for? You can't just like buy a plot of land and be like, this can be a cemetery. Yeah, I mean, I don't think if you were if you had open land in the middle of a city and you're like, I want to make this a cemetery, I think a lot of residents would probably fight that, even though. It, it looks, it actually... It always looks nice. Right? Your neighbors are always quiet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, well, you hope they're quiet. I mean, they take care of their lawn. Right. Right. Although, if you watch enough documentaries, a.k.a. zombie movies, you got to be careful. Let's just say Halloween's going to be a long night. Long night. Got to yeah. own, own one of them shots. Friday the 13th, yeah. How long do you think it takes to get cremated? Oof. Well... You know, there's that mortuary that's right by. Fact, the we see we see the we smoke. See the, yeah, the smoke's going. Like one body, or how long do they run that? They oven for. They only do one body at a time. Oh, okay. That's a part of my two minutes. Two minutes? I don't know. I think that thing's hot. Ashes, uh, dude. Yeah, somewhere around seventeen hundred degrees. Yeah. Um, it takes three to four hours, and then another one to two hours to process. Wow. I would so, never guess that. Once you burn off all the water, soft tissue, organs, skin, hair, the cremation container, i.e. like the casket, I guess they burn that too, according to this. Uh, what you're left with is just the bones. So in complete, the bones are allowed to cool to a temperature that can be handled and, pre- pre- yeah, handled and then placed into a processing machine. That's the ashes? Yeah, so it's not ash, it's bone. It's like really soft... Yeah, because that's all that's left. Damn. Yeah. Let's say, let's say you were going to get cremated. Where would you want your ashes spread? Ooh. I always thought like it'd be your most favorite place to be. Yeah. But at this point in my life, right now, it would be the bathroom. Yeah, just, you just spend some uh, time in there. Sonny, could you just, like, just, just flush these? Just flush these flush down the, the toilet. Yeah, just down the toilet. That's great. Yeah, great. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. I mean, you know, really big fan of palm trees and pools. I really like that. But, I mean, it's like, I don't know if I even, when I say palm trees and pools, I mean, I like tropical. I like right. I like the beach. I like, I like it warm, but I don't know. I don't really, I leave it up to my family right now. Yeah. You know, because, so, on a more serious note, but to relate that, you know, I lost my brother when I was 18, no, 17, uh, just about turning 18, but each of us, the immediate family, did something with part of his ashes. So, it was kind of cool, like, uh, I spread it on a pitching mound, um, I think my, I'm not sure where my parents took it, but I mean... People put it in different spots with what what meant to them, mm. you know. So I mean, so that's that when an they're in that too, place, like, they always that... think about them. Yeah, and it's just it. I think it's part of the healing process. Yeah, you know. So I think you, I'd be fine leaving it up to my family. Yeah, you know. Um, I think I would want to force them to go on a trip, kind of like you're saying, yeah. like, um, you know. I, a lot of my family's from Ireland. Like maybe, like, hey, I want it spread back in the county that our family's from. Kind of. Even though you've never, have you ever been there? So yeah, I'd, I'd we, want it to be somewhere that we went together. Or I would think at least that. Yeah. I don't know. Don't How about you tell them some off base thing in Borneo? So I want you to go run the Leadville One Hundred <laughs> and put it at the top of Hope's Pass, but you have to do it together, and you got to meet a time cutoff. And if you don't, 
start again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long do you think that the cremation's been around? Was it ever illegal? Uh, it's illegal. It's illegal in some religions. Yeah, but was it ever okay? I don't know how long has it been around. A couple hundred? Uh, no, it's got to be around a thousand years. Uh, like a millennia. So two thousand years. Uh, a millennium. Yeah, they said millennium. <clears throat> said tens of thousands of years. It's a lot. It's a long damn time. Yeah. Um, when the human skeleton comes back, uh, comes back more than a cup of all-purpose flour, six to eight pounds. Flour. That well, that's the. Uh, like that's like density oh, that I was they like, described it as. So it's flour? Bone flour? Bone flour. <laughs> Dude, that's a great band name. Bone flour. Bone flour. Yep. Um would you ever think about putting them into space? Sure. But I mean it's You're like, I, whatever, right? Yeah, whatever. Well, uh for five thousand dollars. This company, talk about a fucking racket, dude. For five grand, they'll put your ashes into orbit and where they'll stay until they basically... They, they, they're going to burn up going into orbit. Come on. That's exactly what this says. So they'll end up burning up when they come back into the atmosphere. So they shoot them up, your ashes rain down on the earth. Or... For... Please don't spend my estate on sending my ashes to orbit to burn up raining back Well, down. it's going to cost you five grand to... Yeah, please Put don't the spend my estate on that. Okay, I will. I will write that down. Not you, but that's for my family. Uh, or for fifteen grand, you can launch them into space, where they'll travel into a great blackness forever. Forever. Dun, dun, dun. Um. Yeah, what a waste of time and money. Okay, but I don't know if you're like a space nerd. I could see that like being an attractive yeah. to go out right. You're like, an astronaut. You could be an astronaut. I mean, Neil Armstrong, maybe. You wanted his ashes back on the moon. Ooh. I think we're going back there. To the moon? I think they're launching something soon. Been there, done that, man. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> we already won the race, okay? Let's yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah. Chief Ken Bailey noticed his crew was, not mo- crew was not motivated. Rather than using his own instincts to boost the department's morale, he decided to bring in the professionals. So... Some folks from the University of Texas Psychological Department came out to his fire department and he wanted to kind of figure out why morale was so low. So I'm going to play this to you. Chief Ken Bailey realized staff morale was low and retention rates were poor. So he reached out to the University of Texas Psychology Department for help. And Alyssa Mrazek identified one of the reasons why. One of the biggest ones was a lack of trust amongst crews. To address this, they began to change things up. One example is they started having um, more like friendly competition in the organization where the results for various skill assessments were known to everybody in the organization. In an anonymous survey, they discovered over 90% of the team felt work conditions improved, including King. I can see, I can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Communication between the staff has also improved. While there are still things that need to be addressed, they're headed the right way. In Austin, I'm Pamela Kim. I find that so interesting that adding competition where everybody knows the ranking of everyone else, improve morale. You know, when you are competing athletically, there can be a lot of subjectivity to like that. But even in like team sports where, you know, you have tryouts and cuts and all that, who starts, who's on the bench, that type of stuff. Really like it's, it's seen in practice, like seeing what people can do. You know, they're, and you also are evaluating the game. And, like, sports like, say, cross country or track, anything that has a clock, like swimming, that's money, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, guess what? Uh, trials are coming up. You want to make it past, you know, districts or state or, you know, even, like, Olympic trials. You want to make the Olympic team? Here's the time. Top three or whatever, however many they take. Nobody can argue that. Yeah, but why do you think that – when they introduce that to the, their firehouses, why didn't morale improve? It did, right? Yeah. Well, like she said, 
there's this trust factor. You know, that's a big part of team. I mean, that's like one of the cornerstones of team is trust, right? And we talk about it all the time when we are working out or we're training or doing anything between our crew. You know, we're fortunate now. Everybody trusts everybody. It's automatic, you know. But that any new person that comes in our station has to earn that. And they earn it by just the suffering, the not quitting, the actual, like, getting better. You know, if you don't know something, being okay with it. You know, not trying to hide your weaknesses. That's a big part of it. So when you build trust, then I think people's performance goes through the roof. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does two things. It reminds people how much fun this job is because it takes doing fire ground tasks and adds an element of, like, intensity that's not normally there. Like, oh, man, did you see what they did over at Station 5? I bet you we could beat them, right? Cool. Let's Now this yeah. is fun now, right? Challenger threat. It's no longer this this threat of, hey, Chief's going to be out there. You know, now there's some trepidation. Well, like now it becomes fun again. Um, and also, it kind of reminds people of that competitive spirit that I don't believe is celebrated much anymore. Right? Like it's, hey, I don't want to. I don't want anyone to feel bad if if they're they in last lose place. Or they, yeah. And that's exactly what I, I think a lot of fire leadership thinks when it's the exact opposite we want that we want to we want to feel like that uh that nervous energy when it comes to competing against other it gives you pride in your own crew too totally gives you you pride in your house it's okay to have friendly rivalries yeah it's okay to i think it's okay to want to beat the other crew into their first due right because then when you get on a fire I kind you still of all, can trust those guys. It all goes like that like competitiveness goes away, but that like, all right, I know these guys are dialed, right? Yeah, I hear them coming in on the radio. Sweet, I know what those guys are capable of. Yeah, and I just thought it was such an interesting, pretty big move for you know Chief to. I mean, everybody knows in their department, top to bottom, when morale's low, right? Like everybody's aware of it. They know. Yeah. To actually do something about it because. All you usually hear about is like, yeah, morale's low. Yeah, it's not get much better. Yeah. They're upset this, they're upset of that. Well, the beatings will continue until morale <laughs> improves. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are we doing to improve it? What are we, who are we reaching out to? How are we trying to do that? You know, sometimes well, I can see departments not having the resources to go out and do something like they did, you know, like, or. Well, maybe not get people to come to you, but they can, they can initiate trainings. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing with morale, right, is there's most more than likely the work conditions are not favorable to the front line and there's not support or there's disagreement on appreciation or how much resources they're getting or, or whatever, right, from the guys upstairs. Well, if you want to try to get support from these, you know, blue-collar workers... What do you think the best way to do that is? Show them that you're a blue collar leader. I mean, we talked about it before, but the white shirts have got to go. Oh, the the visual. It, I am that's different already than a barrier. You. That's already a barrier. And beyond that, like we talked about it, it's not a hard thing for a chief to create buy-in. It's not. It's easy. So. Find, like, the shittiest parts of the job that people are complaining about the most. And as a supervising officer, as a chief, as a battalion chief or whatever, even upstairs, go do that. Go run a call. Go, go run and, a call. And write the report. Go run a call and write a report. I've seen it done. I've seen what that does. Right. Because not you may not get buy-in to, say, the organization as a whole, but you will get buy-in – on you. On you. Yeah. Which, if you are doing a good job of balancing the needs of the organization, now you can ask this crew or this person to do some things for you. So now you are getting more production out of them. Yeah. You know? And we even talked about how big it would be if, let's just say. We were doing stairs yesterday. Yeah. It's like if any chief showed up and was like, hey, next time you guys are here, call me. I want to do this with you. Okay. 
So the next time we go, we'll call you. If you were to show up, get in gear, and hike the stairs, it doesn't matter if we lapped you five, six times. It doesn't. It does not matter. You showed up. You're suffering. That's pretty cool. Right. And how fast word would travel? You wouldn't have to do it every day. No. You just got to do it a couple times. No. Right. Yeah, I think it's uh, sometimes you just want to like shake the staff and be like, what you're doing to fix morale is not working. So you need to try something else. And perhaps it's the opposite of what you're doing. Yeah, it, it feels like it's hard to do what we're talking about, right? It's not. It's not. It really isn't. You know, you just got to got to force yourself to think outside the box a little bit. Get outside your comfort get back, zone. Get back to what, you know, what do you have in common with these people? Well, you were once doing what they did. Right. Do it together. I think this is where people would get mixed up. And I, I say that because I'm trying to put myself in their position, right? I am upstairs and I'm like, all right, I'm getting word that morale's low. Well, we still need to put people on rigs so we're still gonna have to mandatory them we don't have enough money for programs we don't have enough money for all these requests that i'm getting okay let's go back to mandatory okay your line's pissed off about mandatory right i don't know a fire department right now that isn't pissed off about mandatory. Right. how could you just ease it a little bit how could you make your conversation as a leader in the department get mandatory yourself or, or go just to the line and work, you know, hey, you know what? I'm going to try to help out these guys. Oh, you got mandatory for 12 hours? Guess I'm going to come in. I'm going to come in and take your last four hours. You don't, even, you don't even have to do that. I had a chief in the Springs that would call the people who were mandatory and apologize. The chief. Oh, the department? Hey. Who? Sorry you got mando today. That sucks. I appreciate it. That's it. That goes a long way. Takes no money. Now, granted, that only go if if, yeah, if, if that happens happening. every single year or every single day for like a year. Well, that okay. Well, now now that doesn't really, you know, make a whole lot of yeah. uh, that doesn't help me feel any better. But hey, maybe we can uh, let you choose what days you get mandatory. So, hey, here's where we're at. I got to get four people on a rig every single day. Here's how I, I want to do that. I want to make sure that, you know, sorry, Tom. Give them some give them control some, Yeah. over their destiny. Yeah. Tom, you're going to have to work two overtimes this month. Pick your days. Yeah. Is that, that doesn't cost any money. It's, it, the hard part about this particular situation is you have no notice. Right. Right. We know our schedules years in advance, right? If we stay on the same shift. Our families know our... Everything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, oh, 30 minutes before, nope, that's not happening. You're uh, you're going to be here. Yeah. One thing also I'm finding is interesting is uh, I think it's hard for maybe some people to understand that men can be primary caregivers on their off days. Like, could you imagine a job telling a mother that she can't go home and take care of her kids. Right. That sounds like, like have fun with the lawsuit, but you can tell men that same thing. And it's not like, well, what do you have to do today? Well, I got to go. I mean, and everybody knows it too. The minute you get home, it's like, if you got young kids, it's like, here you go. Yeah. Like, Oh geez. Especially like, here hey, we go. I just worked a 48 and you come home and it's like, I got to go. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, how many people, their spouses work a, work their own job that they have to go yeah it's only becoming a bigger issue too so morale is going to continue to take a hit with you stuff like that yeah but there are some things that upper management can do to kind of quell the you got to get more buy-in if you're gonna gonna do anything you got to get more buy-in i think it, i think it's an easy formula 